The selection of structural geometries, at least on a more detailed level than the simple idealizations we considered earlier, is typically made after a material is selected, or at least narrowed down to a couple of options. This is because changes to geometry can only be properly assessed in terms of strength and stiffness capabilities if we know the material's strength and stiffness. Furthermore, particular geometries may be difficult to manufacture for a particular material, so it is generally a good idea to know what material you are going to work with before you make more detailed decisions on geometries. But, if we know the material to be used, we can follow a similar approach as before. Find characteristic equations that relate the structural capability in terms of either strength or deformation to material and geometric properties, and investigate the influence of geometry. Let's take a closer look at selecting a geometry by considering a simple example, a bicycle frame. Now you may think a bicycle frame is not really an aerospace structure, but in fact, aircraft in the past have had tubular frame structures. Here, for instance, you see examples of tubular framed aircraft that have been designed in the past. But for our purposes, we will stick with the bicycle example, as it is perhaps a bit more relatable and intuitive for you. So what do you think is a critical limit for the structural capability of a bicycle frame? Would you guess material failure? Well, of course that is important, but what is actually a key driver in the design is the bending stiffness of the rod elements of the frame. Can you imagine why? It actually has to do with controllability and pedaling efficiency. You might be able to visualize this a bit better if you imagine a bicycle frame made out of very strong but very flexible springs. If you tried to ride this bicycle, the frame would twist and warp as you pedaled or tried to steer with the handlebars. This deformation would make it very difficult to maintain your balance on the bike as you would constantly have to move your center of gravity to compensate for the deformation of the bike. So for our characteristic equation, we need to look at the bending deformation of a beam. Bending deformation is actually quite a difficult topic that is beyond the scope of this introductory course. To avoid unnecessary complication, I will provide you with this formula for the end deflection of a cantilever beam subjected to a point load P. In fact, the derivation of this formula is not very important here. Engineers commonly look up such formulas in design handbooks, such as this. What we are really interested in is observing how geometry relates to beam deformation, which is our driving structural capability. If we look closely at this equation, we see two terms related to geometry, the length L and the term I, which is known as the moment of inertia. We will ignore the length as we will assume that the overall size of the bike frame and thus lengths of the individual rods is fixed. This leaves us with only the moment of inertia I. The moment of inertia is a geometrical property of a beam cross-section that quantifies the distribution of the material around the axis of bending moment passing through the centroid of the cross-section, also known as the neutral axis. It is calculated by dividing up a particular cross-sectional area into small elements, multiplying each of these areas by the distance from the element to the neutral axis, and summing all of these results. It is important to understand this concept behind the moment of inertia, but the exact formulas for different cross-sections can always be referenced from a design handbook. We will use the following three formulas for our bicycle example. Let's start with a solid square cross-section of width 24 millimeters as our baseline. Using our formula for the moment of inertia of a square section, we can obtain the following value for the moment of inertia. Now let's see what would happen if we use a solid circular cross-section. The moment of inertia for a circular cross-section is given by the following formula. If we equate this formula to the moment of inertia of a square cross-section, we can calculate that a solid circular cross-section with a radius of 27.4 millimeters will have the same stiffness as a square cross-section. If we calculate the area of this new cross-section, we can see that it is 2.3% larger than that of the square section, and thus would be 2.3% heavier if both sections were made of the same material. Can you understand why this is? 
Well, remember that the moment of inertia measures the distribution of area in a cross-section around its neutral axis. If we look at the circular section, we see that most of the area is concentrated close to its neutral axis, and thus it is less efficient at resisting bending for the given neutral axis. Let's examine another alternative cross-section, a thin-walled circular tube, where the thickness of the tube is 10% of the diameter of the tube. Here we can use the following equation for the moment of inertia of a thin-walled circular tube. Equating it to that of the square cross-section, we can calculate that a 29 mm diameter tube with a wall thickness of 2.9 mm will have the same bending stiffness. However, in this case, the area, and thus the weight of the tube, is 46% of that of the value for the square section. Similarly, for a thin wall tube with a thickness equal to 5% of the diameter, we get a diameter of 34.4 millimeters and a weight that is only 32.4% of that of the square section. Here, the hollow tubes are far more efficient as they remove material that is close to the neutral axis that does not contribute much to the bending stiffness and increases the efficiency of the remaining material by placing it further away from the neutral axis. So it makes sense that bicycle frames are made out of thin-walled hollow tubes. Here we can see examples of aluminum and steel bike frames. But wait a second. Why do the tubes in the steel bike frame seem to be consistently smaller than those in the aluminum bike frames? In order to understand this, you have to consider both material and geometry together. If we look at our bending deflection equation again, we see that the bending deformation is inversely proportional to both the moment of inertia and the material stiffness. Because steel has a significantly larger material stiffness compared to aluminum, we can get away with a smaller moment of inertia and thus smaller tube cross-section. Please do not worry too much if you get a bit lost in some of the math. The important thing to take away from this lesson is that choices in geometry have an influence on structural capability based on how geometrical terms appear in various characteristic equations for engineering structures. A key job of structural designer is understanding how these terms appear and how they can be manipulated in order to make design decisions.